The headlines continue to shout the end of our planet is near because of man-made climate change. Anyone who questions this is labeled a climate change denier. But how do we know if it's actually true or not? To talk more about this is Tom Harris, the Executive Director of the International Climate Science Coalition, and he's based in Ottawa, and joins me now. Tom, thanks a lot for joining me on BCN. Yeah, it's great to be on, Hal. Now, you recently co-wrote an article called Science's Untold Scandal, The Lockstep March of Professional Societies to Promote the Climate Change Scare. What are these professional societies doing and why? Well, it's interesting because they're appointing special panels to write the general statement for the organization that they attribute to the whole thousands of members. The trouble is the panels invariably are supporting the politically correct point of view, even though many members in the societies don't actually support those points of view. So a few years ago, I actually asked some of the societies how many of them had actually pulled their members and showed that a majority of their members support the society's statement that it you know, was supposedly being attributed to all of them. And I couldn't find any who'd actually done that. And you know, in our article in PJ Media, we actually talked about how the professional societies are supporting the climate scare by making extreme statements that in fact, many of their members don't agree with. You know, at the end of the day too, Tom, I mean, there's huge money when it comes to climate change, right? Oh, you're not kidding. Well, right now across the world, there's a billion US dollars a day being spent on what's called climate finance. Now the UN wanted half of that money to go to help real people today adapt to climate change. And of course, climate always changes. Otherwise where I'm sitting now, there'd be two kilometers of ice over my head. So I mean, climate change is normal. And when people like Catherine McKenna call us climate change deniers, we just laugh because we say, well, we deny that we deny climate change. If anything, we're denial deniers. We say that climate always changes and the impact of humans is unknown, but probably very small. So, you know, the bottom line is a lot of this debate has become pretty ridiculous. Now, the mantra we hear in the media is that the science has settled. 97% of all scientists believe man-made climate change is a real threat to our planet. Where do they actually get those numbers from? Well, if you actually look at the polls, what you find is they do one of two things wrong. Either they ask the wrong people. They ask people who study the impacts of climate change, not the causes or they don't actually poll enough people, or they ask the wrong question. One of the questions they ask is, are humans contributing to climate change? Well, of course we are. When you build a city, you have urban heat island effect where it's warmer in the city than in the country. And probably on a global basis, we are contributing somewhat to the global average temperature because of our carbon dioxide emissions. But that's not the important question. If you're gonna spend a billion dollars a day on anything, you've gotta be sure that it's really worth it. You have to be sure that in fact, we're causing dangerous climate change so severe that it's worth restructuring our entire energy infrastructure, getting rid of our inexpensive coal, you know, moving over to solar and wind, which is, you know, these are trillion dollar projects. So they don't ask the right question. The right question would simply be, do you think that we are causing dangerous climate change that we can avert by changing our energy infrastructure. They don't ask that question. And you know, when they do ask that, those kinds of questions, you get scientists all over the place, okay? You have people, very few who say definitely we're not, very few say we definitely are causing dangerous climate change. The vast majority of scientists are in the middle and say, we don't know, okay? We, <laughs> we believe you should reduce pollution and save energy, that makes sense. But the idea that we know that we are causing dangerous climate change most scientists will not commit to that. And I think that's why the polls virtually never ask that question. So what does your research specifically say about scientists and their opinions on climate change? Well, it's very difficult to know because most scientists are quite concerned about not being politically incorrect. You know, you hear stories, for example, Dr. Tim Ball, who you might've spoken to, who's a climatologist in Victoria. He, because of his point of view, has had five death threats, okay? People in the United States have had bullets put through their windows in their office buildings. So in fact, it's very dangerous, not just from the point of view professionally is whether you get promoted or get your papers published, but it's also dangerous personally. It's almost as if, you know, it, there are various issues in the United States that are like that. And it's strange to think that climate change is one of them. So many scientists, you know, we had something called the Climate Scientist Register. And we decided we would ask an extremely simple question that was totally nonpartisan 
and see what kind of support or unsupport we got from scientists. We said, basically, do you think that humans are causing climate change that's, that's so dangerous it's worth these kinds of steps? And many scientists said, I don't know, but I won't answer your poll because they were afraid. We did get, within just a few days, we got over 100 scientists, really well-qualified scientists in the causes of climate change who did sign our open letter. And that's on our webpage. If you click in the upper right-hand corner, you can see climate scientists register and we have it sorted by countries. And there are people all over the world, literally leading scientists who say, no, it seems very unlikely that we are causing dangerous climate change. And you know, there's a report called climatechangereconsidered.org. People can look it up. It's from the non-governmental International Panel on Climate Change. And they cite thousands of references to support the point of view that we're either not causing dangerous climate change or we don't know, okay? So this is literally thousands of research papers in peer-reviewed journals that are just never picked up by the media. Now, the federal government has recently stated that Canada is facing a climate change emergency. What exactly is the emergency? Well, there is the only emergency is that they might not, uh, the Canadians may not appreciate the carbon tax. Okay, that's, that's perhaps the emergency. So they have to scare people. You know, the climate scare, Hal, is based on only one thing. It's not based on observational data. If you actually ask NASA, the Goddard Institute for Space Study, the top people for understanding global temperatures, they will tell you that since 1880, during which time there's been a 40% carbon dioxide rise, we've seen a rise in temperature of only just over one degree Celsius, one, okay? There, there has not been an increase in extreme weather events. Sea level is continuing to rise as it has since the end of the last ice age, but it's not accelerating, you know, and, and you know, you can check the best database in the world for extreme weather events. And that is the state by state extreme weather record of the United States. It's on the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration website and I'll send it to you. You can share it with your, your viewers. And the interesting thing is that in the whole of the 21st century, over 18 years, only two states set maximum temperature records. You go back to the 1930s, I believe it was 1936, 15 states set their records and it still stands. So what you're finding is extreme weather is actually reducing in the best database of its kind in the world. So all of this, the whole climate scare is not based on real world observations. It's based on computer model forecasts of what they speculate will happen if carbon dioxide continues to rise. The trouble is if you go back 50 years, plug in the conditions then, and then plug in what's happened, you don't get today's conditions. In fact, the computer models over forecast the warming of the past three decades by three times. So the models just don't work. And when I spoke to Catherine McKenna a couple of years ago at a town hall, I spoke to her afterwards in the hall, she seemed completely unaware that there was any scientists who disagreed. So I gave her copies of the NIPCC, a huge document. One volume alone was a thousand pages. And her main comment was that it was heavy to carry back to her car. Well, <laughs> only a few days later, she was still saying the same thing. Scientists agree we're causing dangerous climate change. Canada has to lead the way. Well, you know how, even if it were true that we were causing dangerous climate change, Canada's impact is negligible. We're something like one and a half percent of world emissions. China now is twice as much as the United States, and yet they have no targets until 2030, and even after that, for reasons that you can see if you actually look in the base document, the framework convention, they can increase virtually forever. So indeed, what you have is a situation where we'll be cutting our throats for virtually no benefit, whether you believe the science or not. So Tom, we're actually told that drought conditions have increased and are caused by man-made climate change, which will devastate the planet. Any truth to that? And how about all the forest fires? You've seen in the news here, all of the forest fires here in Northern Alberta. Well, a couple of things you have to realize is before white men, before the Europeans came to North America, fires would rage across areas as big as a whole province. And they would burn for weeks until they eventually came to a natural barrier like, like, like Winnipeg or like a, like a river. And, but you know, we've actually had less forest fires since the Europeans came to North America for the simple reason that we're putting them out. 
Okay, so forest fires are not increasing. That's num number one. Number two is if temperature rises, you have more evaporation, you have more rain, the soil is then more moist, and you have a less fire potential. Finally, if carbon dioxide goes up, these, the pores on the leaves of plants shrink, okay? Because they don't need to be as big to take in enough CO2. So the plants lose less water, take less out of the soil. So the soil is moister. So again, carbon dioxide and temperature rising increases the safety and reduces the risk of forest fires. Now, what about sea level rise? First of all, is it actually happening? And if it is, what kind of an impact will that have globally? Well, sea level has been rising at about seven inches per century over the last century, okay? So it's not a very fast rise. And if you go back about 8,000 years ago when there was a lot more ice, sea level was rising 10 times faster than today. But there hasn't been any acceleration recently, so we don't really expect it will do any more than a seven or eight inch rise per century, which is quite easy to adapt. I mean, you, you know, you're talking about this much in 100 years. So indeed, there, there isn't anything to fear there either. Now, the demand is that Canada should replace fossil fuels with green energy. Now, do we have the green technology in place or anywhere in the world that they can do this? 100%? Because I'm of the mindset, you know, to have a little bit of both. Put your energy and investments into green technology and fossil fuels, you know? Don't yeah, put all your eggs in, in one places. basket. Yeah, I think it's fine to continue the research, especially on solar, because solar is not a mature technology yet. There are probably a lot of advances we can make. Wind, however, is a mature technology. We're, get, we're getting about as much as we can out of the wind. You know, countries like Iceland, for example, who have a lot of geothermal, that's a good potential replacement for, um, for coal, for example. But we don't have that, generally speaking, across Canada. So, so there's no way we can replace our fossil fuels. You have to think about it. The world, over 80% of the world's energy is in the form of coal, oil, and natural gas. Okay, wind and solar are a tiny, tiny fraction of that. And of course, they're intermittent. Okay, you don't get solar at night. You don't get wind when the wind is either too strong, at which point you have to feather the blades or they'll break, or you don't get, of course, power when there isn't wind. And, and the big trouble, of course, is environmentally, wind and solar are not really green. Because if you actually look at how they make them, the materials they use are frequently mined in China under terrible environmental conditions. The rare earth elements, for example, that are used in the super magnets on wind turbines come from China. China has something like 80% of the world's supply, or at least production. And you know the conditions under which they're mined are, are really terrible environmentally and from a human rights point of view. And of course, the bird kill. And the big one that I've learned about recently is the bat kill. The amount of bats that are killed is in the millions, okay? And bats are very important to the ecosystem. They eat insects, you know, thousands every night. And these wind turbines are killing bats, not just by impact, but if a bat flies even close to the blades, the low pressure damages the inside of their brain because of the, um, because of the sudden drop in pressure, okay? So it's actually bats are being more hurt and more damaged and more killed than even birds. And there's millions of birds killed by uh, wind turbines. So they're certainly not environmentally green. In China also, by the way, their major energy source for making wind turbines is typically coal. So you don't save anyway. <laughs> Tom, our education system is teaching our kids that humans are causing a lot of the climate change and that it's an imminent threat to our planet and we should not question this whatsoever. So how do we actually convince rational fellow human beings to have a reasonable discussion on this issue? Well, I think the best thing is to talk about the impact of the climate scare, because social justice warriors, people who care about the poor, should be very concerned when they look at a province like Ontario, which got rid of our coal stations and tried to replace it with gas and wind and solar and other sources, which are much more expensive. And as a consequence, the electricity prices in Ontario since 2002 have rised over 200%. 200%. Now, that doesn't hurt the rich but it certainly hurts the poor. There's other examples too. For example, the biofuels expansion is turning lots of uh, indigenous farms into biofuel plantations. It's destroying the, um, the eco-diversity in parts of Southeast Asia. I mean, the bottom line is there are huge impacts, not just on our pocketbook, but also on the environment of the climate scare. And of course, 
if you're diverting a billion dollars a day to climate change, then you don't have it for things like water resources. And I have a friend across the river here in, in uh, Hull who works in water resources. And he was telling me that, you know, the money that goes into climate change is being sucked out of all kinds of other useful environmental programs. Why, for example, do we have the Ottawa River right beside the Parliament buildings? And it's most of the year, you can't swim in it, it's filthy. Okay, I mean, people do, but you know, you better watch, wash the toys afterwards if you have your kids anywhere in the river. So, I mean, we have to focus on problems we know that are real and that we can really impact. Things like air, water, and land pollution. But climate change, the idea that we can control the climate in the year 2050, I mean, we can't even forecast it, let alone control it. Tom Harris, Executive Director of the International Climate Science Coalition. Thanks a lot for joining me today from Ottawa. It was great. Thank you, Hal. And behalf of all of us here at BCN, I'm Hal Roberts. God bless and have a great night.